So I want to ask you: um, Were you surprised when they they featured you with these two films, right? Mm -hmm. Like White Castle and this one? And it's like, why do you think they chose you? Not that you're not a great character, but like out of the multitude of people, they're fascinated with Neil Patrick Harris. This I cannot answer. <laughs> I have no idea. But it's a wonderful thing. They were lovely guys, and they had watched Doogie back in the day, I guess. They mm -hmm. liked Starship Troopers. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Well, and in fact, even filming the sequel, I thought, well, if I, if I don't say yes, if I play hard to get in the sequel, then they'll probably just rewrite it and get someone else that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll probably get, you know, Corey Haim to do it. <laughs> I'm just, I was grateful that they thought I was cool, I guess. Now, in this film, you play such a, a womanizer, mm. like a, a flaming heterosexual, right? And, and you, okay. and, 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 uh, in so much as I brand my initials on chicks' asses. I right, mean, exactly. Flaming. Yeah. And on TV, you play... Uh, like a real stud in How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. But in 2006, you made you did what I consider to be a very courageous thing, and you came out and spoke about your personal life. Yeah. So, the fact that these characters are so over the top, is there a reason for that? Like, how do you balance that comfort zone? Oh, I'm a, I'm able to uh, segment it very easily. I mean, that's as a as an actor, that's what you do is you try and jump into a role as full body as you can, whatever the role is. So, <clears throat> Barney Stinson is so well written in every way that I don't even give it a second thought of separate from my personal life. Playing the Neil Patrick Harris and Harold and Kumar is a little bit of a different story because it's Neil Patrick Harris, so it sort of begets that question. But they wrote the first film and had this wild backstory of my life and childhood that had nothing to do <laughs> with reality. reality. <laughs> so I jumped on board and was playing the character that they even wrote long before they even knew me or had said hello to me. So in the sequel, I don't think that they had any intention of changing direction. They wanted to sort of to keep it going the way it was. No, well, it's just that like when a straight, when a straight actor plays a gay character, sometimes they say they find it hard to do or it's hard for them to find the right person. And you play both so well. Well, not that you play a gay character, but just that you... I play gay characters. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Okay. I but you play a straight guy. A guy dying of AIDS in uh, my next... My next my oh, oh, it's your next film. No, my next... What was it called? The Madonna Rupert Everett movie. The next best thing. The next, the next best, best thing. thing. Yes, best, best thing. thing. Yeah. Well, it's a testament to your talent. Actually, oh, thanks. That you can just do both so easily. And I think it's... I just think it was great. I that think there's shades of gray with sexuality and how one and one's behavior within it. You know, mm -hmm. who you choose to fall in love with is is uh, entirely separate from how one chooses to behave. Whether you're, um, you know, a super alpha male macho guy and all you can talk about are chicks. Whether you're a mm -hmm. super effeminate dress wearing guy and all you can talk about are guys. There's everything in between. So you just you take the role and as it comes and. My personal life is that. <laughs> you have a real comedic flair. Have you ever thought of trying stand-up comedy or No. Oh, no. No? I have <laughs> utmost respect for stand-ups, but writing your own material and then hoping that people find it funny would just make me so insecure. It's the hardest thing in the world. Yeah. I love uh, improv, you know, the Groundlings and, mm -hmm. and uh, Upright Citizens Brigade. Those things, those actors are amazing Amy Poehler and that they can channel funny without having to be funny they just have some gift a conduit gift that it, it blows my mind but well, if I had to sit there and write out jokes that I hoped would land and then get up there in that flop sweat feeling I can't even go to comedy the, clubs because it just makes me uncomfortable it, right, yeah it's the hardest thing in the world it's so uncomfortable because so you're, you're in the audience and if someone's not funny it's so excruciating when no one laughs. Yeah, but then if them. you laugh to make them feel better, then you're giving them the false sense of, of being funny when they're not funny. So yeah. you don't want them to go, uh, what do you mean, that joke killed. Right. Four people exactly. laughed. <laughs> but little do they know. It's even worse if it's a friend of yours and they don't do well, and you oh, have to see God. them after the show, and you can't get yourself to say good set. What do you say? Mm -hmm. you, uh, you've never been better. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> You've had such an amazing career. Can you think of a story that you would consider to be like a turning point in your career? Something interesting that took your life, or it doesn't have to be your career, it could be your, your life in general, a turning point that took you in a different direction. 
Mm, probably more theater would be turning points for me. Doing Rent in uh, Los Angeles was a real turning point for me because I was introduced to a world of people uh, that empower, empowered me and impressed me so much of every age, race, sexual orientation, health level, just everything. It was just this amazing amalgam of gypsies all coming together. And that sort of made me see, uh, see sort of my world in a different way. When I did cabaret here and got to sort of embody that uber sexual, omnisexual kind of uh, role that Alan Cumming did so brilliantly uh, the first go round, that was a real moment that I was able to sort of stand tall and be really kind of gritty that I hadn't had an opportunity to do. And I think that allowed, that opened up my eyes to other roles and, and other opportunities too. It, I think it, for me it's more the theater because you have to commit to a role and do it over and over. And by doing it over and over, you're kind of digging, digging a hole and finding out more about it and you really carve it out. And so by the time you're finished, you feel like you've done a lot of work. On a movie or a TV show, once you've done that scene, you never revisit it again. You never revisit it. So right, it's yeah. sort of it's sort of fleeting. But when you have to sit in like Weimar Germany with track marks and bruises, and and you you know it's angry and sexy and not and pathetic and crying and it's everything, and you do that over and over and over. It Was really that on a trip that you made to Europe, or is this a project? <laughs> no, this is cabaret. <laughs> oh, cabaret. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great because it was historically based and. Uh, you know, Sam Mendes directed and uh, Rob Marshall co-directed, so it had, it was a really strong production. So doing something like that really sort of changes you. Okay. Can you think of a lucky break that you've had in your career, a particular thing that maybe you got that you didn't expect to get, or something that came out of nowhere? Well, the fr I mean, I came from a small town in Mexico, so I went to a, a acting week-long drama camp, and Mark Medoff was in charge of it, and I was lucky enough to be randomly chosen to be in his cold reading audition class and got to work with him. He wrote Claire's Heart and they were casting it at that time so without him actively observing me for that couple hours of that class that one day I probably wouldn't have been in his mind to be in that movie and none of this would be happening. Wow that's great.